What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to Pro B Pro. Tell you what, bit of a rough weekend. Uh, Eagles got knocked out predictably, and we were so damn close on that Keegan outright. Feels like we should have had it. He should have had it. But alas, we came up just a little bit short. Justin, how was the weekend for you? Hopefully a little bit better. Well, no, about the same. Uh, obviously, the Browns got killed. We could spend the whole morning talking about football, I think, after the Browns getting drilled and so many question marks with your Eagles. and um, Yeah, it was not very fun. And then we got a sick family, and, and uh, the golf was kind of unpredictable. Um, I, there was, You definitely saw the names at the top that you thought you would see, but there was also – um, the Grayson Murray deal, I, I, he's super talented, but kind of came out of nowhere. Yeah, that was uh, that was quite the finish. And, and actually, so I I had the, the Keegan outright at 60 to 1. And if there had been a two-man playoff with just he and Ben on, I probably would have hedged that just by betting on Benny. Uh, when it was a three-man playoff, I did not. I'm very glad that I didn't because if I had hedged, I wasn't going to Grayson. And then I actually had the thought to do it when when everyone had hit their approach shots onto the green and it was like you know that benny has five feet you know keegan has 17 and you know grayson murray's like he's got to drop a bomb or not so i i thought about hedging at that time and again there would have been just on benny with the hedge no grayson so very glad i didn't do that because that would have been a double extra painful loss uh, if i had but man what a finish uh, i i really felt like keegan should have closed it out i don't know about you yeah um Let's see, he it was one of those deals. I think we ended up even talking about that outright on the show last week and, and kind of came up with the idea that you, Keegan Bradley should never be 60 to one in a field like yeah. that. Um, I think that's kind of how he, you know, he came to the forefront of just the, the price was just wrong. And, and um, not that it's a bad fit, but it's not an over o- overly great fit either. Um, it just mm-hmm. he, he's too talented to, to be at that price. Yeah, so there there are a couple of things that I want to talk about here. And, and our one and done play ended up being Sahith Thagala, who I also had an outright on. And the the thesis for the Keegan outright and the thesis for the Thagala outright are so similar. It's that it's exactly as you just said, like they shouldn't be at the numbers that they were at in that kind of field because they are so volatile that when they are on they're on in a way that they can compete against the best fields in the world, let alone a field like that. We saw like both ends of the variance there. We saw Keegan very much on his game for four days. We saw Thakala very much off of his game for two days. So I don't look back at that event and say Keegan was a good bet. Thakala was a bad one. I think they were the same type of bet. And we just saw, you know, one of them play well, one of them play poorly. It just as easily could have been Keegan ejecting after two days in Thakala. Uh, comp- contending down the stretch. Yeah, yeah, I don't disagree with that. Um, I think the one thing, looking back at it now, done later, um, but was the fact that of our four that we talked about, everybody made the cut. Yeah. Um, on was one of them in contention. Mm-hmm. And I think that we kind of, and I'm kind of new at this, um, I think that we kind of underestimated the crowd that we're playing against too that's mm-hmm. going to look at ownership. And I think that we kind of leaned on ownership maybe a little bit more than I, I think the reason we went from on to Thagala was was in part due to the ownership situation. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that we're going to have to take a little bit more of that into consideration going forward is I, I think that there's a lot of people in the industry that are playing this contest that are going to kind of do the same thing. So I think Thagala mm-hmm. ended up with a higher ownership than we we predicted as well. Yeah. I mean, he was only 4%. So we did correctly stay away from the chalk, like Chris Kirk. Um, and, and the other thing that I wanted to, to mention about one and done is like, it doesn't really matter that we had a miscut, right? You either have somebody in contention making a, a good size amount of money or you don't. And it, so to me, like there, all the money in every single week is going to be in first place, second place, third place, uh, not, you know, I, I grinding out a T20 or something like that. So the miscut doesn't really bother me. And again, like we're probably going to have a fair amount of those if we continue to lean on the type of players like the Gala, like Keegan Bradley, who we are inviting in that extra volatility so that their odds of finishing that top three are a little bit higher given their skill set. Yeah, I think the only one we missed out on would been obviously is picking on. Uh, You know, if we end up, if we ended up on him, obviously of our four, then, then, you know, 
we, we definitely had a chance. And, and mm-hmm. I think that we'll probably find ourselves in that situation. If we're going to pick two each, we're going to end up yeah. leaning, looking back and saying, I wish we would have taken this one. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I think that's probably, probably uh, true for sure. Um, last thing about the recap, uh, Grace and Murray's story for anyone who doesn't know it is a really, really interesting one. I actually played probably 50 some mini tour events against him, uh, in the last seven years or whatever. Um, and you could tell that he had, he was like on his own level of talent where he would go out in a, in a strong mini tour field and he'd win by six one week. And then he'd make an early double bogey the next week and end up like finishing second last. Just an, an incredibly like, not just hot and cold, but demeanor hot and cold as well. Uh, explosive, both in a good way and a bad way. And goes to rehab, comes back, and now seems like a, a different player. Like all, all Sunday, I think we saw a level of course management from him that we wouldn't have seen in the past. So I don't know how familiar you are with his game, Justin, but did you see the same thing from him? So I, I'm overly familiar of his older days, very volatile person. Um, I could go on, I could tell a bunch of good Grace and Murray stories uh, and I'll try to not tell any personal ones. So uh, I've talked about before previous shows of, you know, playing in these big money games in West Palm beach and, and uh, Myrtle beach and that kind of stuff. Well, one year we ended up playing, <laughs> These guys from North Carolina, which is where Grayson's from, brought down this new mini tour superstar, right? And they wanted mm-hmm. all these swing bets. And, you know, th- they were pretty juicy, right? A bunch of $100 a hole swing bets. Well, the way I was still playing mini tour golf at the time, maybe even had Latin America status. And he said he would give me two T spots and play. And, and then, you know, gave a, a big group of us. And we we're playing a bunch of 2v2s all the way around. Mm-hmm. But we, I mean, at the time, is he better than me? Absolutely. But can I beat him on any given day, especially at that point? For sure. And then you're going to give me 50 yards off the tee, which is my weakest point of my entire game. Mm-hmm. And obviously, we had a really good week that week and made a bunch of money. Um, the guy that backed all of our action came and gave us – I don't even know how much money he made, but it was <laughs> it, it was a really good week. But the whole time, even – you know, I we played against him. I only played – with him one day, but we played against him like four or five days in a row. Um, just a volatile personality, like the way that mm-hmm. he acted. And but he would hit shots. I mean, I, I watched him hit a three iron from 250 that I was like, man, this guy's next level talent, right? Yeah. That different sound that we talk about, the one that I talked about with like Neiman and some of those guys when I heard him hit balls on the range, he can make that sound. Um, that being said, I would I never thought that he would win on the PGA tour just because yeah. of the person he was. The interview, and I even, I'll go as far as that I doubted his, how genuine he was. Mm -hmm. So, like, with all the stuff that happened, I've always just kind of doubted, doubted how genuine the, the, what he said really was. Especially after he fired Kip Henley, after Mm -hmm. Henley helped him get his tour card. Uh, The interview on Sunday was really good. Um, Mm -hmm. Everyone, it seemed very genuine. It seemed like... um, he wasn't just trying to say the right things. So yeah. uh, good for him. And and I hope that, that it is as genuine as it sounds. And I hope he has a great career. I mean, it, the, the thing that stood out to me the most was he said, is this a career changer? Yeah, maybe, but it's not a life changer. Um, mm-hmm. So that that's a big deal. Uh, yeah. He gets to, I mean, what Augusta, the players, the PGA, yeah. I mean, he's into a lot of all the big events now, but he said, you know, this isn't going to change my life. And, if he truly means it and looks at it that way, then good for him. And, and then I think he has made big strides. Yeah. And again, like, I think we just, we saw that in the, in the course management, he was, he was making smart decisions all around. Whereas, you know, I, I think I had played one final round with him before where he started a little bit slow and then just started making bad decisions, like took a three wood out of the rough on a, on a par five over water and, barely even reached the water and, and things of that nature. And, and, uh, and so really good for him. And given how talented we both know that he is and has always been like it, improving the course management to the point that he has like this, this might not be the last time this year that we see him not just contending, but maybe even actually on top of the podium. So uh, very interesting to kind of track where his uh, season goes from here. 
guys talented enough to, to make some real noise. Uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about when it comes to this event was I think down the stretch, one thing that we did see is the difference between having a lead that you have to protect and being the, the chasers where, you know, Ben on gets to the last hole. There's nothing in his mind other than either birdie or Eagle pipes drive pipes aren't in the middle of the green actually had a very makeable Eagle putt. Keegan feels like he has something to protect, you know, sort of chickens out on the drive, making sure he doesn't pull one too much and, and make a big mistake. Then he has to lay up the wedge shot. He worries about going long, comes up a little bit short, can't make the putt. Grayson Murray has the same layup shot, same wedge shot. And there's no fear for him of going long because you either make birdie or you don't. He hits it to a couple feet. So uh, I, I was curious if you, you had like the same read down the stretch where Kagan was clearly protecting and it was just a much easier birdie for those guys chasing. Uh, it's, it's always easier to be the hunter and not the hunted, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's just the way it is in life, everything about it. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, especially the, the, the Grayson Murray shot. I mean, he, he, you know, he's obviously playing really good and, and mm -hmm. he had nothing but birdie in his mind. It's easy to attack. I mean, you know, Ben on just did what Ben on does. Right. I don't mm -hmm. like, I think he's one of the few people that's kind of immune to that situation. Um, you know, I, I don't know. The Keegan Bradley stuff is, uh, it, it's easy to be critical of it. He just hit, he, I, you know, I think part of it is he just hit a bad shot. Yeah. I mean, it's, look, it's, it's tough to win golf tournaments, right? Like even when you're in the quote unquote driver's seat, like he was, you probably still only have like a 25, 33% chance of winning something like that. So uh, I, I certainly don't hold it against him. I'm sure we will be betting on him once again in the near future, just because he's always mispriced given his volatility and explosiveness. So um, tell you what, let's, uh, let's talk again about the big giveaway coming up next week. For those who haven't heard yet, uh, both Justin and I are giving away a free lesson, one each to two lucky winners. Uh, Justin's going to be giving a short game lesson, your choice. Do you want bunker play? Do you want putting, chipping, whatever? And then I'm going to do a long game lesson again, your choice. If you just want it to be distance, if you want it to be iron swings, whatever the case is, uh, two free lessons to give away. All you have to do to be in the running is like this show, subscribe to the FTN Network YouTube channel, and then follow at FTN Fantasy on Twitter. That's it. You do those things, you are in the running for these free lessons, some community building. Uh, maybe we'll even record some of the lessons and we can like make it a segment of a show or something or, or, or release some short videos about it. Uh, so lots of fun ways that we can take this. Uh, but please, please, please uh, get in the running for all those we want to, we you know, we, we want to be able to do a lot more of these and uh, we think that they could be an absolute blast to do. The more people who enter the running, the more uh, we will be able to do throughout the season. Yeah, for sure. It's always fun. And, and I hope that we get a lot of people on board to do this. Um, we're going to have a good time with it. And I, I absolutely plan on talking about some of it during the show. And I think it'll be a fun little segment that we can do with it. So. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a sneak peek. We're going to talk about Scotty Scheffler's putting uh, uh, later on in a way that we, we might even be able to give some like really uh, helpful insight to anyone listening who just wants to become a better putter. So uh, just to keep that in mind for the rest of the show. Uh, but first, we got to talk about the American Express and the course fit this week. One of the more exciting models that we've seen so far this season in the sense that basically every single aspect of golf is really predictive here. The only one that has a lower weight than usual is approach play. But the the weight on approach play isn't lower than usual because approach play isn't as predictive. It's just that everything else is so predictive here that approach play, like it's probably as predictive as usual. It just in comparison to the others, it's a little bit lower. So distance is important. Driving accuracy is important. Around the green play is important. Putting is important. Everything, as we said, is important, which goes directly against what John Rahm said here a few years ago, if you remember, he walked off one of the greens kind of screaming like this is such a fucking putting contest or something like that uh, in frustration. It's anything but. And so uh, it, a bit of a fun conversation to have about how a player, especially of Rahm's caliber and with his golf IQ can be so wrong about a course. Uh, but maybe we'll get a little into that as well. Uh, what do you think about the course fit here? So it's funny that I'm glad this came up. So as, as a player, as a former professional golfer, as a person, if I played that golf course, when I got done, I would think of it as a putting contest as well. 
just because it it, it comes across so easy tea to green mm-hmm. um you know it doesn't you don't feel like there's a lot to be had anywhere else as long as you're doing what you're supposed to tea to green that being said i think that john rom is so elite tea to green that it ever i mean it is a putting contest for him because of the lack of rough and um that kind of stuff so uh, you know i think there's kind of a battle battle into that that he just believes he, do, he doesn't realize how good he is Tita Green, so it yep. makes it a putting contest for him. I, I think you nailed it at the end there, which is he he's so good Tita Green that he sort of takes his own talents for granted at times and doesn't realize that what is an easy shot for him is not necessarily an easy shot for everybody else. And I think the reason he was calling it a putting contest that day was very specific to the pin locations and and not so much that the the course itself is a putting contest where he felt like hole after hole, he couldn't really go after pins. He had to aim, you know, 15 feet away from the hole. And because he's so damn good, he kept hitting it 15 feet from the hole and just assumed everyone's hitting it 15 feet from the hole in every hole. And and therefore it's all about whether or not you can make those 15 footers, which he was not that day. Uh, but I, so I love the fact that that moment is still in everybody's head because I think the industry comes to this event and they say, all right, I need good putters this week. And it's not really the case. Like, yeah, putting is predictive here, but so is everything else. And you can, you can really gain an advantage here. I think finding the guys who are going to, to play really well tee to green uh, just based on their skill set. Yeah. And I think the other thing is when you hear of a golf course point, you know, as all of them collectively playing so much under par, you immediately think putting contest, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I know we did when we, you know, a mini tour event, when it took 25, 28 under, we're like, Oh, who's going to make the most putts this week. Mm -hmm. That's just what we thought. Right. But we didn't realize you still have to hit good tee shots. You still Mm -hmm. have to hit good iron shots. Um, You And a lot of times, you know, you get guys that get going with their irons and hit it in the leather a lot. And and then putting really doesn't matter because the Mm -hmm. opportunity was such perfect with such perfect conditions that, you know, you're going to get a lot of people that hit a lot of shots really, really close to the hole where putting kind of doesn't matter as much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the other way to look at it is, you know, who's going to make more birdies, the guy who's putting really well, but only gives himself, you know, six birdie looks in the round or the guy who's not putting well, but gives himself 12 birdie looks in the round. It's probably the guy who's not putting that well, but gives himself twice the opportunities. So uh, l- lots of reasons there where, what, what we think as players is just so often either skewed or just completely wrong. And in this case, I think Ron was a little bit blinded by his own talent. And, hey, if that gives us an edge, fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I, I can think back of many rounds where I was like, man, how'd you play? Well, my score is really good. You know, I shot four or five under. But, man, I just couldn't hold a putt. Well, and then you go back and you're like, man, I hit 17 greens and had a chance, you know, to make it on 13 or 14 times, and I still made four or five of them. Mm-hmm. But you just – for you if you give yourself that many chances, you think everybody has that many chances, right? Which is not necessarily the truth. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's go to our favorite bets of the week. Do you have any outrights that you're staring at? Uh, I know you had a fantastic matchups week this past week, by the way. So a brand new this coming week, Justin's matchup bets are going to be in the tracker at ftmbets.com. We'll get him into the betting discord as well. So we can post all of those plays. So if you want to tail someone who was 11 and one at one point this past week, you probably want to get into that discord and that bet tracker access. Yeah. Well, two and two and two on Sunday wasn't the best, but uh, yeah, 11 and one going in and it was fun because you'll, and, and you'll be able to watch the way that I play it. And, and the things that I do is, is I'm kind of a creature of habit of leaning on the way the guy's playing. And also mm-hmm. generally speaking, if I see a guy that just can't hold any putts that is, is, noticeably better than anybody else tee to green i tend to lean that way and i also look at people that have more to play for right that that a guy that is trying the guy that i leaned on a lot last week was Patton kazire and his matchups mm-hmm. because he has a lot to, he had a lot to gain and, and and so i think you know he was a huge part of my my success um as far as this week's go this week goes <laughs> I mean, you know, we're. I'm going to go back to see what 50 to one here. I think that's a ridiculous mm-hmm. price on him. Um, it just doesn't make any sense at all to me. Um, 
The only other one that really stood out as of right now, now, now let's remember for me, I can't get the really long shots like you guys can. So, I mean, there's a few guys that, that I would probably go to that I, that if I could Brandon Wu, which we, you know, I was telling you about that did a lot of off season training on hitting it further. Um, if he continues to drive it straight, he'd be a great fit here. Um, the only other one that I might lean on a little bit is, is Tom Kim at 25 to one. I think he's a good fit here and I think he'll play well. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to say too is if we're gonna if everybody's gonna take Rom's advice and make this a putting contest, does that make Sam Burns the biggest play on the the best play on the board? Yeah, that's an interesting one. I wonder what Burns' number is now um, because he's his given his name value, he's a lot lower in our expected strokes gain projections than I would have expected. But you know the. Most of his game, it just hasn't been that solid. And he's 33 to 1 here. And I believe that we had his win probability, yeah, only 1.4%. So no value there. Um, which again gets to the gets to the idea that we are not valuing putting as much as most of the industry will. Not because we're not valuing putting, just because we're valuing everything else so much more than everybody else is. Yeah, I I but as soon as you know, I Everybody mm-hmm. talks about that with Rom, and I was like, "Well, that's just true." Like as far as DFS goes, that's going to get me off Burns immediately because if people are thinking it's a putting contest, everybody's mm-hmm. going there. Yeah, but he also gives you a lot of win equity, a lot. Like he, he's a proven winner, so it's hard to argue with with somebody that knows how to win too. Mm-hmm. All right, let's talk Brandon Wu because Brandon Wu is one of the three bets that I have already made. I've got him one twenty five to one on uh, Bet three sixty five. That is an each way bet. He's also available at 170 to one over on FanDuel. You can almost create your own each way this week where the the 125 to one each way gives you roughly like 31 to 32 to one odds on his top five. On FanDuel, you can create something similar where you're going with the 170 outright. And then you can also do the top five market individually for 28 to one. So you're, you're not getting much worse odds in the top five market. You're getting better odds on the outright market. Personally, because he's such a long shot, I'd rather have the better odds in the top five than the win, which is why I I put more into the uh, each way bet than I will that, that 170 to one outright. But man, both of these are great. We have his win probability at 1.0%. So basically should be 100 to one. We have his top five odds at 5.7%. Just to give an indication, even that 28 to 1 is at 3.45% implied win probability. So that that 5.7% for a top five is is just a fantastic number. If you can then get that up to 31, 32 uh, to 1 instead, it becomes even better. So I love the Brandon Wu bet. And it's, it's interesting because last week at the Sony, he drove it really well. His irons were fantastic. He was fine both on and around the greens. He was more accurate off the tee than he was long. That doesn't really tell us anything because so many of those holes you're kind of clubbing down. So very interested to see if that driving distance starts going up for him. But the the awesome thing about this bet is that distance goes up, then we absolutely could see him become an even better player than he is. But even before there are any signs in the data of that distance coming, He's projecting as a really, really solid value in the outright market and the each way market this week. So I love this bet. And and the fact that you're on it because you see this like very specific growth in his game just adds fuel to the fire for me. Yeah. And and just to give a little backstory, I have a a friend here in Dallas that's a a trainer that works with a lot of professional Mm -hmm. athletes, but mostly golfers and speed trading. And I know that that he's been in the gym with, you know, throughout the winter with them and, and um, well, you, you guys probably know, you heard me talk about him. It's Bobby Massa, the one that traded the, the, uh, Monday queued for the, um, Byron Nelson this year, Craig Ranch. And I told you he was going to lead the, lead the field and driving distance. And I believe he did. So, um, you know, I know he's been in there working on it and, uh, you know, we'll see if it, if it comes to fruition this week, I'll be pretty excited to see it. Second bet of the week for me, uh, your boy, Cam Davis, you talked about him as a breakout candidate for the season as a whole. We, we saw the flashes in round one this past week after a very disappointing uh, century to start the year. But actually, like, round four of the century, round one of the Sony, that's the upside that we can get from Cam Davis. All he needs to do is put it together for maybe three of the four rounds. He doesn't even need to do it for all four 
We've got him 2.4% to win. He's available at 66 to one, which is an implied win probability of one and a half percent. So love him here again, going with the each way uh, because his, his top five odds are essentially 10 to one, uh, or so I should, I should say we have him at 10% uh, for that top five. And with the each way he is, let's see, 5.7% implied probability of a top five. So absolutely love this Cam Davis bet. I'm sure you're on him as well. Yeah, I'm a fan of Cam Davis. I don't know if I'll end up there, but he's one of those guys too. I'm going to kind of, I'll wait and see and, and, and watch, but you know, there, there's certain guys that I just wait and look at the matchups and who they're up against and stuff. Um, you know, so we'll, we'll kind of see what happens as far as that goes, but you're absolutely right. Last round to first round, like his upside is there. Um, it also comes down to how aggressive he gets. He, you know, he, I think that he can kind of get over aggressive at times. And, you know, a guy like where you saw Rom hit at 15 feet a lot, he might be a little bit more aggressive and then make bogeys where he doesn't need to. Yeah, I, I do think that's possible. It's yeah. also possible that he just makes birdie after birdie after birdie. And yeah. he's, he's one of those players that, you know, his volatility is, is very much specific to just a couple skill sets. It's basically his putting can be awful it can also be the best in the field for the entire week and then his approach play as well is really streaky he's going to drive the ball pretty well and his his around the green game it's not always the most consistent but i think it's a lot better than people give him credit for just because again like when he's on he's really on and that that does extend to his short game as well but for the most part it's just are the irons there and is he making putts and uh and i i, I don't know what you think here I, I wonder if a, if an event like this where he should get a ton of opportunities with his irons to score and a ton of opportunities to make some birdie putts, maybe there's like this enhanced chance that he gets into a rhythm and that we do see the spike week coming from those skill sets. For sure. I mean, he he's definitely capable at any given moment. And, you know, we, we've talked a lot about trying to be ahead of the curve and, and hopefully staying on him here. You know, no nobody's really – coming back around to him, especially after not playing very well down the stretch, you know, last week. Do you like the fact that he's been putting so well of late and it's his tee to green game, which we know long-term is going to be the, the strength of his game that that has actually been holding him back to start the year? Or would you rather see that the, the tee to green game is there and he just needs to get the putter going? Uh, I personally would rather see him need to get the putter going. I tend to, I tend to think that, you know, I know you're most uh, there's so much more luck involved with putting than there is yep. T to green. So, um, you know, that's my initial, my initial thought there. That being said, I, I I'm not, uh, he might be more of the exception than the rule. So the, I, I think this is one of the most fascinating questions when, when projecting golf, when betting on golf, all these things, which is where, where does the regression come soonest? And in this case, you know, I, there, there are basically two questions. Are you regressing to tour average or are you regressing to the player's average? So when, when Cam Davis has these stretches of, of, of putting where he's gaining 0.8 at the century, 1.8 per round at the Sony, how much should we anticipate that regressing? And obviously we should, we should anticipate that regressing to his average. Whereas, you know, when you, when you have like a guy who has this just outstanding season putting, then you expect it to regress to tour average. So in this case, we're expecting it to regress to his average. But then there's also the sense of like the most stable aspects of the game, as you said, are the, is the ball striking. So in that case, like the, the argument for wanting ball striking to be good, T to green game to be good and the putting to be bad is pretty straightforward because you know that the T to green game is the most stable, so you expect that to continue when someone's hitting the ball well. I wonder, though, if because the ball striking is so much more stable, so much more predictive, if we should expect more regression to the player's baseline in those categories. So here we have Cam Davis. When he plays really well, when he contends, it's often because he's getting spike weeks from the putter. He's getting those spike weeks right now, I feel like we can be confident the ball striking is going to come back because typically he is a good ball striker. So I don't know. I, I think that I kind of take the opposite side here where for his chance to win, I actually want his 
the the aspects of his game where we know that we're going to need the spikes, I want those spikes to be occurring now, and I can trust that the ball striking will come back. Whereas maybe if we're talking just like DraftKings, if we're talking his chances to make the cut or to finish top 20, in that sense, maybe you want the strength of his game to be the strength of his game, and then you can just hope for that that putting spike. Yeah, I mean, you know as a player too, like you go week to week and you putt putt really good for a couple of weeks and, and you start to gain some confidence, especially yeah. when the green types are similar. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't expect him to overly regress a ton. That being said, like when we struggled with our ball striking one week, we put more time in on the range and sometimes forgot about the other aspects, maybe yeah. to a fault. Mm -hmm. So we we'll just hope that he's not doing that and that he's continuing – now, that being said, I don't know what his routine is, but hopefully he has the same set of drills that he's going to continue to go through and work on and and that kind of deal. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't disagree, especially, like I said, with somebody as talented as he is, it's a different it's a different aspect than, you know, maybe your more middle of the middle of the road player. Well, I, I think also it's important to note, like, you know, this, the Sony Open, that golf course distance just doesn't help you there. Now he's going to a course where his distance will help. So that in and of itself is a reason to think that his ball striking could be a lot more effective this week. I agree. Uh, I mean, same, th same thing goes back to the Will Gordon that I talked about mm -hmm. last week. Like you could get mm -hmm. the exact same thing here of, you know, obviously playing well. Um, and, and now he gets to take advantage of his length a little bit more. So um, kind of the same idea. Obviously I believe that Cam Davis is more talented than Will Gordon overall, mm -hmm. That being said, the upside of, of Will Gordon, it can be very elite. Final outright of the week for me, at least for now, uh, you know, certainly could add more as the week goes on. Final one, though, for now is JT Poston. We have him 3.9% to win. Uh, was very encouraged last week. He was second in our expected strokes gain model, which was a little bit surprising to me, but he ends up with a, a final round nine under par, including just an absolutely scorching hot stretch. From 6 through 12, he went birdie, 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 eagle, par, birdie, birdie. And I was like, holy crap. He went from completely off the, the leaderboard. Like he was maybe 30th or something down in that range. And then all of a sudden, he's tied for first. Uh, just a, a wild stretch. So loved seeing that from our model. And we've got him fourth in win odds this week, all the way up at 3.9%. He's available 33 to 1 within each way. And uh, just for some uh, some more context, that 33 number puts him at 2.9% implied win probability. Again, we have him at 3.9%. So plenty of value here. And because he is popping in his win odds, not because of volatility, but because of his just expected outcome, his expected sort of gained is so strong uh, that, that each way is especially good, I think, because we have his top five odds here at 16.7% where the implied odds here are 10.8%. So 16.7 to 10.8. Just absolutely love this each way across the board. Curious your thoughts on posting. Um, uh, let's just a, a simple reminder that this is pretty unscripted. So we don't talk about a lot of this before. Um, he's number one on my list for one and done this week. Um, that's how I feel about him. So, um, I think, I think you, we have our one and done picked because he's number one for me as well. So, I mean, I think you're going to get, you get the, the course fit, the form, uh, the course history. Not only does he fit here, but he's got the history here as well. And I think it's time for him to break out. So um, uh, the, I, I'm a big believer. And I, if I could get him at 40 to one, I would be playing him in the outright market too. The one that I saw was like 33 to one, which still, mm -hmm. I still could get behind, but, Yep. I'm going to try to get the 40 to one number. I I'm a big believer in posting this week. I think for what, uh, as much as I was against him, not against him last week, I just didn't love the number and all the hype on him. Um, mm -hmm. I thought that this week is a way better spot for him. Yeah. We'll, we'll get to the, the one and done talk as well. Um, and apparently we're going to talk a lot about posting. I wanted to, to point out right now, the, the odds across the board, at least here in Virginia, the best available is that 33 to one number available at bet rivers. At Bet Rivers, you also get the each way, which is why I, I love betting there. And then I'll also go to Bet 365 for a slightly different each way at 30 to 1. The difference there for anyone curious is on Bet Rivers, the each way, the standard each way is one fifth the payout for a top six. On Bet 365, it's one fourth of the payout 
for a top five. I, I think that extra 5% of, uh, of payout is better than the, uh, slight, uh, then better than that extra spot that you get going from a top five to a top six. Uh, it's close enough for me that what I'm, what I'm doing to start this season and what I will probably do throughout the season is instead of saying, all right, I'm only going to do this each way bet on bet 365, or I'm only going to do this each way bet on, on bet rivers. I'll just do one unit on each. And that seems yeah. to be, to be easier. So that way, you know, it's, it's half a unit on the outright on each and then half a unit on the placing on each. And then you'll be able to look back at it at the end of the year and see which one was was more profitable as well. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, and and not only which one's more profitable, but which one seems like theoretically better based on just how often does that extra spot come into play? How often does the uh, – and then, of course, like how often does the added payout come into play because you have to actually hit the bet for that, that extra payout to be worth it. So – um, that'll do it for the best bets section. We can get right into the DFS first look here on DraftKings. Uh, it sounds like we both might be pretty high on JT Poston to start lineups. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I like Poston, but I also like one of my first deals is, is figuring out who I think is just supremely underpriced because mm-hmm. I, feel, I feel like it's easier to build that way than it is for the, you know, the higher end guys. Yeah. Um, I think that Alex Smalley is too cheap. He he really should like when I first looked down the list. I think he's seventy three hundred or something. I think his talent is going to come to the forefront this year. Um, should be a good place for him. And then Brandon Wu, obviously that we've talked about earlier. Mm-hmm. I think he you know he's down in the low seven thousands or right at seven thousand. I think he's going to be too cheap. So I'm going to kind of build down there and see what happens. Um, yeah, I, I like Poston. Um, I, I'm probably going to stay away from the Uber chalk up top and the really high, high price guys, the highest I might reach would be like a, a Tom Kim um, in that area it would probably be as most expensive. I could go, albeit I really like Caitlin this week. I think that he could, I like that he, you know, kind of played good two weeks ago and, and kind of knock, knock the rust off. So um, that's just kind of my early thoughts there. There's there's one thing I want to talk about at the top of the board. You mentioned kind of wanting to to avoid the chalk up here. When we look at the pricing, so we've got Scotty Scheffler 11-4, Xander Shoffley 10-9, Cantley 10-8, and then a drop to Sung Jin Im at 10-1. Keep that distinction in mind, and now let's talk about our expected strokes gained projections. The disparity is a little bit larger. We've got Scotty Scheffler 2.2, Xander Shoffley 2.1, Cantley 1.9, and then all the way down to Sung J M fourth at 1.3. So when I look at the difference between the pricing and our expected strokes game projections, the very first thing that I notice is I think this trio of Scheffler, Shoffley, and Cantley should be more expensive relative to the rest of the field, where they should be like 12-4, 11-9, and 11-8. So I think there's a very good chance that I will play one of these guys, but – Anyone who knows me in, in PGA DFS knows that I typically like balanced builds because I, I like building lineups that are almost more about like having the strongest, weakest link that I can possibly have rather than the best, quote unquote, best plays that I can have. Uh, so that's why I typically lean balanced. But this week, I think there's such a disparity between our projections and the way that this field is priced. There's a very good chance that I'll be starting in this top range. Yeah, and like I said, I think if I play one, it's going to be Cantlay, and it's not out of the question. Um, I think that that's what makes them intriguing and makes them where I think they're going to be a little bit chalkier is because their price isn't quite as high as, as one would think it would be. Um, there's And if you want to do that, there's and I'd love to get your thoughts, there's two guys way down on this board that are just played really good at Pete Dye golf courses. If you believe in any of that correlation – and that's two guys that just got through Q school. Um, the Australian kid, Indicott, has been playing really good. Um, had a great year, the Corn Ferry stuff. He could play good here. And then Hayden Springer as well. So you got, um, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know that we really have the data or seen what they're going to do on the PGA Tour yet. But if you wanted to reach deep down in for guys that are, you know, really, really talented that I could see kind of making a mark here, especially if you wanted to get to those top guys pretty easily. Endicott's an interesting one. Um, you're absolutely right. He just played phenomenally well at Q School. Prior to Q School, 
he was really, really struggling. Where he had a he had a T28 at the Sanderson Farms in October. That was the only event that he didn't lose a considerable amount of strokes uh, since the RBC Canadian Open June 11th. We did see flashes of very real talent from him, like that 12th place finish at the Canadian Open last season. So he's one of those guys that we we know that the talent is there. We absolutely know the upside is there. We haven't seen it very often. Um, maybe now that he's here, maybe we will see it more often. Uh, I think for me, he's somebody that I'd rather start to see it before I really buy in, uh, particularly in DFS where, you know, again, like I said, it's it's so much to me about getting everybody through the cut, uh, really focusing on having a strong weak link, if you will. And, and he seems a little bit too risky for me, given that sort of overall strategy, but absolutely cannot question the upside. Uh, basically gained by, by data golf's true strokes gain estimate, 3.13 strokes per round at Q school. That's good enough to win a lot of PGA tour events. So the upside is unquestioned. Yeah. The only thing that I worry about is the very different conditions of Q school in this week. Um, and, and I'm, I, you know, as far as he goes, I may look into the, he obviously showed the windier and the more difficult it plays. It might be better for him. So, you know, it, it's just a name to, to think about going forward because I think he does, if we can get to a windy, you know, harder golf course, I think he's a breakout candidate, you know, sometime at this point. And, and for anybody listening, uh, you should, you should really hear that and keep it in the back of your mind. Cause remember last year uh, it was, Austin Eckroat and then Minwoo Lee, I believe, you know, before those names became names that people were using on a week to week basis, Justin called, uh, called them breakout candidates. And then they were at the top of the leaderboard. So, uh, when he, when he talks about a guy potentially breaking out, we want to listen for sure. Um, last note that I want to make from a DFS standpoint, one of the things that I have really kind of moved towards this season is this concept of comparing a player's top five odds to their ownership, where, this just seems like a, a perfect kind of range of probabilities where it's almost a one-to-one -one comparison. And when someone is more likely to finish top five than they are to be owned in DFS, that makes them really solid plays. Yet another reason to potentially go to this top range. We've got Scheffler at 39% to finish in the top five, Shoffley 35%, Cantley 28%. So they'd have to be really, really chalky to not flash in that type of analysis, which brings me to my big question for you here, Justin. Scheffler's putting. Do we think he's going to figure it out? Do we think he's going to continue to struggle? One of the things I want to reference here is Kevin Kistner's comments, I think were, were pretty fantastic about Scheffler's putting, where we haven't had this type of analysis in the booth because we've been stuck with Azinger for so long, where he's just kind of making stuff up as he goes. But Kistner gave us some really, really sound analysis for anyone who hasn't heard it. Kisner talked about the way that Scheffler aligns on his putts and his feet are closed to the target. So if he's trying to aim right edge, you know, most guys, when they're, when they're perfectly aligned, their, their feet are not going to be aimed at the right edge, but they're going to be parallel to aiming at the right edge. Scheffler's are closed to that, which means he's aiming too far to the right with his feet. His shoulders are counteracting that. And they're not just adjusting to be square. They're over adjusting so that his shoulders are open to the target makes it really difficult to match everything up. That's why Kisner thinks he's really struggling. Uh, when you hear that, do you think that that means that we should expect Scheffler's putting struggles to continue? Or do you think that, Hey, at least there's something to point to Scheffler. Maybe here's that analysis. He works with that with his coach. And now maybe he has a more clear path to actually figuring it out. Well, I can promise promise you that, you know, working with Kenyon, he's already heard this. He knows this. It's it's one of those things, though. Do you, is he putting in enough work to get comfortable with it? Um, that's the hardest thing about it. Um, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, I said something about continuing to trust his new setup and his new putting stroke. It looks like he's gone away. From, he, he went away from that and didn't trust it as mm -hmm. much and got kind of the, the lines all crossed up. Um, it's it. Kisner was awesome, by the way. Yeah. Awesome in the booth. Like, he, can't say enough about him. Um, no, I, th this is also comes back to the John Ron comments about the putting contest. If you want to say this is a putting contest, you're going to throw out Scheffler. That being yeah. said, where is he pretty good from? 10 to 20 feet. He just struggles yeah. from the close range. So 
is it, you know, because he's going to give himself so many chances from that range, is he worth a look? Um, kind of works backwards of what you would initially think. Yeah, obviously I haven't run ownership projections yet for the week, but it's going to be really interesting to see what people do with Scheffler. If they think it's a putting contest, like, is this going to be the lowest owned that we could possibly get Scheffler uh, in a field of this strength? Because uh, that would be extremely enticing. Again, we've got him 39% to finish top five, uh, 54% to finish top 10, 94.5% to make the cut, 14.5% like, to win. But the guy would be a phenomenal DFS play if he's not – one of the chalkiest players on the slate. Yeah. And like I said, it's intriguing when you've got a guy that's going to hit it to, you know, the distance that, that mm -hmm. he doesn't struggle from that much. Right. And the greens are going to be they're They're not overly difficult where he should have a lot of three footers for par four footers for par. Like it, that shouldn't be a, a huge issue. It's pretty, you know, they're not, yeah, I'll, I'll, it'll be interesting to see see what happens as far as ownership of those top three guys. Do you know? Do they go down to Cantlay, and I have to get off them just because of that extra few hundred dollars? So let me ask you this: one of the reasons why Scheffler has this alignment issue with his putting is that this is how he aligns for his ball striking. He's the best ball striker in the world, so this alignment is obviously really comfortable for him. If you were Scotty, would you try? to make that type of alignment work in your putting as well? Or would you try to fight your natural instincts on the putting green and try to become a square with the feet, square with the shoulders putter and make an improvement that way? Maybe the, the most important variable here, which I personally do not know is, you know, he hasn't been a bad putter his entire career. When he was, when he won the masters, for example, in that stretch of his career, he was actually a really good putter. Would you go back and look at that time of his career and say, you know what, were you more square at that time or were you making this work at that time and just stick with that? The common, uh, a pretty common theme is open shoulders for putting. The The hard part is the closed stance and the open shoulders, right? The combination, but it's a very common, I mean, I know I struggle with it fairly often too. As a matter of fact, I know a lot of good players that they went to the claw to get the right shoulder deeper and to, to not get to it, not because they were bad putters, but just to be more consistent with their setup. Um, I'm surprised he hasn't, I, you know, like when I'm, when I was playing a lot and, and I would struggle with open shoulders, I would, uh, I would practice cross-handed yeah. because it gets your, you know, it gets you more square. Um, I would, I would go back, you know, to, to standard whenever I was playing, but it would just kind of help me, my eyes visualize a more square everything. Um, I'd be interested to know if he tries any of that stuff or if he thinks about any of that stuff or if he's just kind of accepts where he's at. Yeah. It's interesting. Like one of his best friends, Sam Burns, for anyone who hasn't seen it, like his, his putting routine is he, he addresses the putter, gets his hands cross handed to set his shoulders and then goes back to his usual putting grip. Uh, so just like, I think you nailed it. Like it's, it's something that, uh, I really wish we had a little bit more information on exactly what is he practicing? What's he trying to accomplish? Uh, because the, the question of whether or not he's going to fix his putting is so incredibly important to what we're trying to do here. Cause he's just so much better than everybody else with ball striking that if he can even get himself back to like just a mediocre putter, the winds are just going to pour in over and over again. Yeah, I agree. And and you see a lot of guys that like kind of hang their left arm down and try to get their left shoulder forward and then go into their grip. So, uh, you know, uh, I don't think it would hurt him to work something like that into his pre-shot routine, but yeah. All right. Let's talk about one and done before we get out of here. Uh, important note to start, which is, you know, it's, it's one of the one of the last events, uh, we actually have one more after this one before we get to the elevated event. So right now the, the winning purse or the overall purse, I think is like eight and a half million. When we get to the elevated events, it jumps to 20 million. So there's, there's definitely not the amount up top that there is going to be in so many events, which to me definitely says we want to shy away from these top end guys, even though we're not going to be the only ones that felt like maybe Scheffler, maybe Shoffley or Cantlay are under-owned for their win probability just because so many people have the same idea of saving them for bigger, better events. 
Uh, what do you think? Do you think we should bypass these three, wait to use them in an elevated event? Um, I think you have to think about it, right? It, it can't be a, a decision. I mean, um, you know, depending on ownership and stuff mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Uh, I, th I don't see using a guy like Scheffler here as something positive just because in, he's going to be the favorite in so many fields this year that yeah. are elevated events that where ball striking is going to be more important that, you know, that I just think that um, I, I wouldn't want to use him. I think if any of the top three, if I was going to use any, it'd be Cantlay. I just think that his success here and the way that he plays, that would be the one. And, and so I would kick around the idea on him, um, but that would be it. What ownership, like how low would they have to be for you to think, ah, oh, man, I kind of wish we used him this week. I don't think for the, for the top two, I don't think there is a low enough ownership yeah. to be honest. I think um, there, there's just two, you know, I'd be interested to know the exact breakdown, but in an elevated event, what is it probably about fifth that pays about the same amount as the winner here? Um, I, I think it would be third, maybe, maybe fourth. So, I mean, you know, I, I just think that, you know, those guys are going to have so much win equity yeah. other places. I think if you got Cantlay under 1%, I, I think we would have to have to look there. I, I was using 1% for all three of them. I don't think we're going to get sub 1% on any of them, which is why uh, my top guy, JT Poston, as I said, he's fourth in our win probability. He's fourth in our top five odds, fourth in our top 10 odds. He's just fourth across the board here. So uh, I don't think he's going to be super popular. Even if he is, I think he projects well enough that we could get off to a, a good start here with Poston. Yeah, I mean, like I said, he's my top one and done. Um, I, I, that's where I lean as well. So the only other guy that I kicked around as well as with my outrights is is, is Tom Kim. But I think that we're going to want to use him in an elevated event mm -hmm. as well and and just kind of see um, he's one of those guys that kind of goes with his form. So we'll kind of yeah. see where his form is too. Yeah, not only his form but also his course fit. Like I think they're going to be, be some events where – uh, there, there are certain aspects of it that just like really scream Tom Kim, uh, whereas this one's just kind of all across the board. The my second choice, also just sticking with my outrights, would be Cam Davis. Uh, really, here it's because I think that he will be extremely low owned, where we know he has the upside, but because he fumbled away his opportunity last week because he started the season so poorly at the Century, I just think that very, very, very few people are going to go to him. Additionally, if people just think this is a putting contest and they don't realize how important off the tee play is here, particularly driving distance, that's another reason why people aren't going to use him. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if if we used Cam Davis and we saw that he's like 0.3% this week, which does entice me, uh, particularly if Poston ends up like 5 to 10%. Um, maybe as the, as the week goes on, we'll get a better idea of that ownership, but I don't think we could possibly go wrong just saying, hey, Poston was the first guy in your mind. Poston was the first guy in my mind. Let's lock that in and not overthink it throughout the rest of the week. Yeah, the, it, I almost hate the fact that he played so good on Sunday, right? Because I think I would have ended up here without that final round, and I yeah. think the final round is just going to gain more ownership. Yeah, I think you're 100% right about that. So maybe we do want to monitor the ownership. What do you think? Do you do you think there's a there's a number that, that Poston could get to where we'd rather have someone like Cam Davis, or, or is it just like – Look, there are enough good golfers in this field that no one's going to be so popular that we don't want to go with the best option. Uh, if I hadn't seen the way that the ownership came out last week, I would say, yes, there is going to be a number we get to. But I think that the ownership came out so different yeah. than, than what we what we expected. I think we probably just ride it out this week. Uh, to be to be clear, I don't think it came out <clears throat> super different than we expect. Like we were we were definitely right about who the most popular guys were avoiding them successfully. Uh, but yeah, we can, we can talk about it more throughout the rest of the week. It seems like Poston's most likely our answer. Yeah, I would, I would guess so. And, and that, that being said, like, I love the idea of somebody like Cam Davis. We haven't talked very much about Min Woo Lee today. Um, this is another one that, but I want to kind of see what he did in the off season and see how he comes out form wise. But he's another one that like the talent around a place like this, that he has of, and the upside, he's going to win sooner so, sooner rather than later. Yeah, we've got him at 1.2% to win half of the odds of Cam Davis, but uh, <clears throat> I wouldn't be surprised if that's a little low just because I think we've seen from him that he's more talented than his results have indicated, and 
and maybe he starts to really pick it up. So, you know, he, he's somebody that I would almost even consider manually adjusting his projections up if we start to see him start the year uh, really, really well. But uh, anything else on this event that you want to touch on? No, I, th- I I really like this event, especially for matchups. I, I like uh, to lean into the to the stadium course side of things here too. So it'll be a fun week. Yeah. So uh, one final reminder: uh, we will have Justin's matchup bets in the FTN Bet Tracker and the FTN Bets Discord this week. I will add any additional outrights to the tracker as well. We'll talk some price picks in the DFS Discord. Uh, so get into all of that if you are interested. And one final reminder about these giveaways, free lessons. Who else is giving that away? So again, follow uh, FTN Fantasy on Twitter, subscribe to the FTN Network YouTube channel, and like uh, this YouTube video. Hey, if you want to drop a comment as well, just kind of give us your your thoughts, your favorite one and done play, what you think about Scotty's putting, anything of that nature, go for it as well. Maybe we'll give you some bonus points in the draw for those free lessons. Thanks again, everybody, for tuning in. We'll catch you next time.